Thank you, Rosie. If you look at the top and bottom of this bit of the Bible we're reading, we've got verse 1, have a look at it. We do not lose heart. And then look at 16, near the end of the passage, we do not lose heart. So there's a pretty good chance that he's talking about not losing heart, right? You don't have to be a boffin to work that out. And think about it now. If, if we just came in here tonight, you said, great. Great opportunity tonight to lose heart. Wouldn't it be fab if we came in here and said, it'd be fantastic to go out really miserable. Christian life's rubbish, really hard, not the least bit inspired. That's the way to go. Paul really cares that you and me don't lose heart because he knows you are one two-minute block away from that all the time. You just have a mare on the way to a game. You do something, you say something really stupid. Or you just don't play well. Or you blow it in front of your friends when you really, really were trying hard to represent Christ. Or you're just lonely. Or you're doing stuff that you can't tell anyone and your heart is in your shoes. Welcome to the human race. This is all of us. And so Paul really cares about saying to us tonight, now listen, I'll say it for myself, listen Graham Daniels, focus properly and I can help you not to lose heart when it really matters. So that's what we're after, right? How to stay in good heart when it's really rank in life. When Jesus is your saviour as a sportswoman or a sportsman. So that's what we're on. Now, clearly, as you saw that little film with Paris Edwards in, and as sports people, you'll know the whole thing about perspective and clarity of focus and visualisation. You know it very well. Fix your eyes on the better future. How are you going to play? What's the team going to do? What's the pattern of play? Right, you've gone two down in football. There's 65 minutes gone. Right, picture it, picture it. How are we going to play the last 15? What's our picture? What's our shape? What's our order? How are we attacking? How are we going to tuck in when it gets tight? Think future, get a grip on your emotions. Let the brain drive through the emotions to control now. And there's a tweak on this, it's kind of cognitive behavioural therapy. I'm not a sports psychologist, but I've just been around it long enough. There's a tweak, you just go, right, go ahead, don't go to the end of the game. Go to five years' time, or five months' time, or five weeks' time. Look back on what you're about to do now. I don't know. Three quarters of the game gone, you're having an absolute mare, and you throw in the towel. You don't show anyone. Of course, you just lose your bottle. People who know, know, because they're watching you. But you throw in the towel. And they say, hey, don't just go to a future vantage point and look back. Go there now, transport yourself ahead a month and look back on this last 15 minutes of a match and ask yourself, do I want to remember myself as an absolute bottler when the pressure really came on me? No, I do not. Right then, come on. Live now, play. Often we work like that in sport. See, what Paul's doing here is class. This is an experienced Christian telling very inexperienced Christians in Corinth how to think future, stand future, look at now, and what we should do when it's really hard to be a Christian. I'm going to use two friends of mine. One's dead now, one's about my age. Uh, Charlie and Alan. I'm going to use an example as we go through of an older bloke who meets a younger guy, learns about the Christian faith. Charlie met Alan when he got converted to Christ when he was about 16. Alan at the time was ancient, like nearly 40. Dear, dear me, what an old get. But Charlie thought he was like, like Jesus. Because every time he ever met Alan, Alan was like perfect. He never seemed to do anything wrong. He just didn't seem to have any sin in him. And as Charlie went on as a Christian in those early years, and he went to uni, he'd sometimes go home and he'd bump into Alan, and Alan was just always for Charlie. 
always trying to help him wrestle with living for Christ. And as you hear their story on the way through this, of an old boy who looks back to help a younger guy, watch how Alan mentors Charlie. Because by the time he dies, Alan makes sure that Charlie works out that the great power in Alan's life isn't his own ability or his own strength or his own spirituality. Alan will make sure before he dies that Charlie gets this big thing about perspective and visualization and cognitive behavioral thinking about how the future represents now. He will get this. The Christian life isn't a changed life. Christian life isn't your ability to transform yourself. That is the stupidest thing you could ever think. But we do it by vanity. I'm a Christian and I'll change myself. And I'll become a better person. And I'll fight through the difficulties and the hard times because I've got it in me. The Christian life isn't a changed life. It's an exchanged life. It is a brand new person inside me. However hard you try, however hard you work, you will never, ever, ever understand the right perspective on eternity without knowing that Jesus Christ himself is your great power inside. Let me show you this. I'll show you in three little headings. Here's Paul's lesson to the young church. One, focus on the fact that God is at work in us. Read with me verse 7. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not for us. Flick your eyes back to verse 6 and you'll see what he's talking about. And Greg was speaking in here last night about faithful gospel ministry. The treasure inside you is the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Somewhere inside me lurks the very power that through the stars into space lives in me. We could spend four hours, couldn't we, trying to say that to each other? How on earth can you say that? Right in there somewhere, I don't know where. Somewhere in me. The very power that through stars into space drove in my car with me today from Cambridge. Ha! It's class. I've got Christ in me. When you jump on the train to go home, the very power that threw the stars into space, the spirit of the risen Jesus lives in you. It's outrageous. But see what it lives in? This stupid jar of clay, this fractured vessel, this poor, failing bloke with all surpassing power. Look at 8 to 11. Ever feel like this? We're hard pressed on every side. Oh, I love it. Look at the butts. you just got to look at the butts. The scripture speaks for itself. He just does contrasts all the time. He's just saying, life's really tough, Corinth. It's how it is. But, 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 look, we're hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. This is how you've got to look at life. You've got to sort of project yourself forward and go, this is me. Look, I'm hard-pressed, but I'm not crushed. But every time you've got to say, because Christ lives in me. Not because I'm hard. Not because I'm tough, not because I'm smart, but because Christ lives in me. We're hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. Hard pressed on every side, but not... He's going on, isn't he? Read it, don't look at me, it'll be horrible. Look at the page. Like, it just goes on, doesn't it? Come on, Paul, speed up. We've got to finish it half past. But not crushed, perplexed, not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. Can you brag like this? We always carry around in our body the death of Christ. Yeah, hello, my name's Graham Daniels. Yeah, great. Yeah, I'm a wreck. I know. No, I really am. No, no, I'm ruined. But it's okay, because... Uh, the life of Jesus can be revealed in my body. For we who are alive, verse 11, are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life might be revealed in our mortal body. I'm not going to change this pathetic mess that I turn into in a split second. 
the slyness, the deviousness, the manipulation, the lying, the cheating that comes in an instant with such ease. But that's why I'm glad that the Christian life isn't a changed life, because if it banked on my ability to be like that, I'd be finished. I'd be long gone. Now I've exchanged my life. I've got Christ. You've got Christ. The greatest power in the universe is in you. In that broken flesh. We have to focus, says Paul, on the fact that God is at work in us, Corinth. It's not me at work in me, it's God at work in me. When Alan was about 80, uh, he got cancer and it went on its way quite far. And he went to a hospice and he was in the hospice. And Alan was obviously, uh, Charlie was much older by now. And Charlie used to go and see him and... Uh, uh, they're not pre they're, they're proper names of proper people, by the way. It's a true story. But you'll see why I can't say who Alan is, because it would be unfair. And when you see him in heaven, he might tell you himself. Charlie went to see him, and uh, Charlie was a married guy with kids at this point, and Alan had cancer. And he was really ill. And he'd go to the hospice, and he said he was unbelievable. He said, I'd go to the hospice, right? I'd walk in, and there's Alan, and he'd go... All right, Al, Charlie, how is it? How are you doing? What's going on? Tell me all about it. Tell me about Saturday's game. How do you play? Vets, football, obviously. <laughs> how do you play? Tell me about the kids. Tell me about work. Tell me about your name. All for him. And he's ruined like he's about five stone lying in a hospice bed. It's all about Charlie. Focus on the fact that God is at work in us. Inside you, you've got to be really clear on this. You've got to go all the way to the finishing line of seeing Jesus. And you've got to look back to being 20. You've got to look at yourself now and you've got to go, Christ is in me and I will meet Christ one day. And he's never leaving me and he's exchanged his life for mine. So if I come back to here, I'm just going to look there. And I'm going to go, my body is a ruin. My brain is a ruin. I like to think it's a bit classy, but it's not. But inside me is the power that I'm going to meet one day, and wherever I go, he's there. And I'm alive. Even as I die, I'm alive. And here's the thing, you know this, don't you, already? When you know you're absolutely rubbish in the way you behave, there are still people at uni who go, you're one of the nicest blokes I've ever met. Or they say to you, I mean, you're such a nice person, you're so kind. And you think, you have no idea. You absolutely have no idea what a waster I am. Guess who they just saw inside you? They saw Christ in you. So here's the first part Paul wants to say to them about focus. Focus on the fact that God is at work in you. You haven't exchanged life of the power of creation by the Spirit of Jesus, and he lives in you. Here's the second thing he teaches them in this passage in verses 12 to 15. Not only is God at work in the Corinthians and in the believer, but secondly, focus on the fact that God is at work through the believer. And that's what I hinted at there. Your friends will say, but she's lovely, you know. They see Christ, but see how this tips. When they see Christ, You've got to give them a chance to know that they see Christ. Here's the most fatal thing in sharing the gospel. I've talked to people who say, I just don't know how it works because, see, I go to work or I live in a house with friends and, and this is what happens. I really try and represent Christ and let him live in me and I really try and be decent but nobody ever asks me about Jesus. And as you get older, it gets loads worse. People say, well, I'm in this office, right? And I really try and do the right thing all the time and be ever... But nobody ever asks me about Jesus. Mm -hmm. You've got to say something about Jesus. People just think you're a really nice person, even when you know you're not. You've got to speak of Christ. Look at what he says here. Paul, verses 12 to 13. So death is at work in us. 
even as I am a fractured human being in my club at uni. Here's what happens. Life comes to you, my friend. It's weird, like, but you've got to be proud that you're fractured as you look from the finishing line. I'm 30 seconds away from nonsense all my life. And I know that's who I am, but you know when I'm here at 19? Christ is in me. The power of eternity is in me. I'm going to see him, and he's going to flourish in me. And the more broken I am, the more wonderful he is. And then you have to say to people, it's Christ. Listen closely to me. If you don't cross the pain line, being a Christian will be dull. Really dull. Cross the line. It's Christ. Speak of Christ. Get the eyes off you. Get the eyes on the exchanged one who lives in you. Extrovert or introvert, loud or quiet, speak of Christ. Look what Paul says here. Friends, it's hard, right? Some of you will find it easy, but you're probably slightly odd. Most of us don't find it easy. Honest, it, it, I'm not saying it for the sake of being kind to some people. Most people don't find it easy. You train on evangelism, you train how to do it, and you come to the conference, you go, yeah, good idea, I'll practice that, I'll have a go at that. <laughs> Try it when you're under the cosh. Every time you cross that pain line and speak of Christ, you expose people to see that you have an exchanged life. And it's not you who's the great one, it's Christ. And it changes the way they see you. They may not articulate that they see Christ, but they will see that it is Christ in you, not your ability. It's like their eyes shift. And that's why verses 1 to 6 were last night. You have to be faithful in speaking of Christ properly. So, look what he says in 14. He's compelled to speak of Christ because that he who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Christ and present us with you in his presence. He has to speak of Christ's finished work on the cross. And 15, he writes to the Corinthians, all this, i.e., all my brokenness and all my pleasure that Christ lives in me and all the words that I say, this is about Christ, not about me. Don't look for anything good in me. It's, it's an exchange life I have. I've been given a present, I don't deserve a thing. I've just got this wonderful person inside me. He's my best friend. He never leaves me. Even when life is useless, he never goes. It's Christ. That's what he says. All this is for your benefit. You don't love your friend if you don't tell him of Christ. If you milk it that they think you're a nice bloke, because they see Christ in you, it's a fraud. Because you're like pretending it's you who's the nice one. But it's a lie, because you know yourself, right? And somehow the great creator of the universe says, I live in you. Can I come in? No, I'm coming, actually. Let me in. And he says, right, I'm here. Let's live. And you go, but I'm not good enough. I can't tell my friends the truth about me. If they knew, I'd be in all sorts of a mess. I mean, I couldn't tell anyone at church. And he says, no, 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 no. You don't get it. You've got an exchange life. I'm in. I'm not going away. You, I'm, wait, I'm going to take you all the way home. Now, listen, you are fractured, deeply fractured, but that's why I died, because I'm not. And I'm the one in you, and please tell people that it's not you who's delightful. Tell people that you're poor and hopeless and weak, and tell them that I'm delightful, so that they may see that you're humble, and they point to me. And that's what he does for Corinth. And look what happens in 15. Grace is reaching more and more people and they may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. And therefore, verse 16, we do not lose heart. Grace spreads because women and men like you and even like me in my ancientness, you can never forget that you are a treasure in a jar of clay. And it's not your brilliance at changing your life to be a better bloke that makes you beautiful to somebody. It is you saying it's Christ in me. But to say it, you've got to believe it, right? 
you've actually got to believe that you are loved tonight whether you've been absolutely shocking over Christmas or you've been like Mother Teresa you are loved the same in the midst of the deepest sin that you committed last year as when you had your whole body projected towards God in praise and worship can you get this you were loved exactly the same can't believe it right who can believe that I mean how can I believe that no no the Christian life is me becoming a better bloke I mean Jesus came for me died for me beat death for me but now it's up to me it's not it's unbearable if it's like that because you've set yourself up to fail you haven't exchanged life it's unbelievable the deepest moment of sin in 2017 and the greatest moment of joy in Christ he loved you exactly the same if you can't believe that you cannot understand the doctrine of grace the gift that is yours that's what he's done that's who you are that's who I am and I'm absolutely buzzing off it because I can live on this because I live through Christ Christianity is Christ not Graham that's what it is it's wonderful and you know Alan when he died Charlie used to go in and Charlie said to me honestly mate he was unbelievable like he was unbelievable people would say how are you Alan how are you today and he'd say <laughs> well I look more of a wreck than I've always been but I've always been a wreck I know I've lost a stone in the last week but I'm still the wreck that I was then but Peter or whoever the nurse was Helen I've got Christ and Charlie said he couldn't stop himself smiling when he said I've got Christ he just couldn't stop his eyes sparkling when he said I've got Christ now you've got to look and focus on this right focus with me one day you may not get to 80 one day that's you so now project back right I'm gonna be there who am I I'm she who has Christ how much does he love you billions how much do you bring to the table Zippo <laughs> Wow! so it's not my capacity to change at all I've got an exchange it's free right yeah but it cost him everything now live and by the way stop bragging politely about how nice you are point to Christ oh the conversations you can start I found I can do this to Wednesday pretty much in a week. Hiya. Yeah. All right, Pete. Bump into Pete in town. Not the nurse. I just made up Pete again. Hiya, oh, Pete. All right, All right Dano. Yeah, good. How you doing, man? Tuesday. Good. Do you have a game Saturday? Yeah, we played such and such. Oh, good. How do you get on? Yeah, one, three, one. Oh, good. You notch? Uh, no, I'm left back. Oh, yeah, I forgot. Uh, <laughs> Pete. Uh, I said, good. He said, what about you, Dano? How do you get on? I said, yeah, we're good. We're doing nil nil at Colchester. Great. He says, um, he said, good, what do you do at the weekend, Pete? Oh, played Saturday, went out for a couple of jars, went around my mum's on Sunday. Ah, oh, great. What about you? Oh, I went to church Sunday. It was this great talk, Pete, about frustration and anger. I said, do you know what? Let me neck. I sometimes think I'm the most angry man in the world. What a relief. I've got Christ. Ever been to church, Pete? There you go, cringe -o right as long as you know what to say when there's a no it's easy have been to church Pete ma mate never ever thought of it nah ah fair play you training train tonight who we got Saturday easy be really good at being normal got it find your own way I can do weekend talk till Wednesday and it's easy then isn't it on Thursday you start talking about Saturday and then you say oh there's a great talk at church on Sunday about <laughs> Split the week into two halves, Wednesday lunch. Pain line. Don't negotiate, see, just live. But you, it's really important that people know it's Christ who's beautiful in you.
because it's, let's not be modest about this people think you're very nice when you're a Christian but, and they should because you're good at, obviously we, we don't show all the nonsense right and they see the beauty but you've got to give the credit where it comes from it's Christ so nearly there look at 16 to 18 here's the third point of three so first how do we keep focus how see, can you can you hear what I'm doing I might not be doing it very well here's the big idea at the beginning and the end don't lose heart well oh my goodness are you gonna lose heart when you think it's how good you are that makes you a good Christian oh my word you'll be lower than a snake's belly most of the time you just feel like oh, I'm rubbish absolutely pants might as well give up now well, that's how you'd be but what if you go right I don't want to lose heart what's the first principle Christ is in me it's not my ability at all it's Christ okay heart jumps yes right next if it's Christ in me does Christ work through me if I say something about Christ well people then start to go ah oh, it's not just she's a lovely girl because of course they won't think you're a wretched girl ah oh, wait a minute hey I've known her I've known her since she was a fresher yeah yeah she, she's a nice girl and she's a good player she, I like good with the girls isn't she she's a Christian man oh I wouldn't mind a tenner for every time I've heard that at my age he's a Christian man a religious guy Christian here's the thing right somebody meets one of those stupid Christians and then they meet another one and another one they go oh they're all the same like really nice quite competitive mind a really nice bloke nice girl she is and you know some of the Holy Spirit goes ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum, join the dots maybe the common thing of all these people isn't that they're just nice or they're committed or they're stuck into the club maybe Christ is the common goal and therefore they're three very different people actually she was like that he was a bit like that he was a bit quieter Ooh, maybe Christ could live in me because you haven't got to just be like him or just like her but if you keep your mouth shut they may never compare notes and what if you got to heaven and the Lord Jesus said yeah by the way uh, do you want to meet the people who were influenced by you who came to know me through your fractured vessel when you spoke of Christ despite your failures you go yeah well there's none obviously and he'll go yeah come over here there might just be this great crowd of people who go yeah well I met you when we were 24 and when you worked in London and we and then when I was 27 I met this other fella and you know I thought God he's just like him and then when I met the third person this girl she was a bit louder than both of you and I thought blimey sin and then it dawned on me it's Christ yeah I gave my life to Christ when I was 31 yeah <laughs> great uh, do you want to meet my kids uh, my mum and dad got converted as well and my next door neighbours and yeah when I was 80 this nurse in the hospital got converted just before I died of cancer and you my friend will then go it was Christ it's always Christ you don't lose heart stop thinking it's Christ start thinking it's you then you're stuffed you'll be miserable as sin <laughs> you will you will anyway where were we 16 to 18 <laughs> focus on the fact that God has prepared a great future for us right here we go here's the last bit look there he is so we don't lose heart I knew there was a link there somewhere so we do not lose heart though outwardly we're wasting away inwardly we're being renewed day by day this man as you know from the book of Acts and reading Corinthians has experienced suffering weakness sickness injury hardship pressure frustrations and he articulates sometimes that he had despair you know what I haven't touched on I've touched on tough times but I haven't touched on deep existential despair I'm a complete loser I'm depressed emotionally I'm a wreck how can Christ be in me Graham fine give us a talk that's that's fine you know but mate if you really knew me if you really know the things I'm up to you wouldn't be so easy ozy about everything is Christ I mean you'd really go for me because of the deep failures that nobody knows about you know I told you at the beginning Alan was determined to show Charlie 
that it really is an exchange life and it's not about your ability. Charlie tells the story everywhere he goes. This is how Alan dies. The day before he dies, Charlie goes to the hospital and he's been in a hospice rather for three or four months, I think, three months. And he walks in and there's Alan. And for the first time ever, he's not smiling. He sees Charlie and he doesn't smile. Charlie says, all right. He said, nah. He couldn't believe it. He just had a shock. Nah. He said, why not? He said, well, there's two things, really, Charlie. He said, look, here's the first one. I don't re I want to see Jesus, but I don't, I don't want to go today. My wife's still alive. I love my kids. I've got grandchildren. I, my brain's going well. I, I, don't, I don't always want to go to see Jesus. I, I'd like to live a bit longer sometimes like today. I thought, wow, I've never heard him say that before. And he said, oh, he said there were two things. He said, Alan, what, uh, what's the other thing that's making you down? He said, oh, dear Charlie. He said, what? He said, I keep checking out the female nurses. And Charlie went, oh, my word, that is disgusting. <laughs> you dirty old man. It's an 80-year-old man. Charlie says, I just, he said, I must have stood there for two minutes going, nah. Nah, nah. I thought all that stopped when you were 40. It's an eight-year-old man. Hypocrite. All these years. Whoa. And then he died that night. Alan dies that night. Charlie comes in the morning. And Charlie says, the last words I ever heard Alan say were, thanks be to God for our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom I have hope. The Christ who is in me, Charlie, the one who exchanged his life for mine is the one who is with me tonight, even as I do disgusting sexual behaviour as an old man when people wouldn't imagine I was. He says, and I shall meet him soon, and he will call me into my home and say, I love you, Alan, because it's not what you did, it's what I've done that makes you mine. That's what it says here, 16, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, but we are being renewed day by day. For in our light and momentary troubles, all the crap, all of it, every one of us, for all of that nonsense, read scripture with me, for all our light and momentary troubles, we are achieving an eternal glory that outweighs them all. Christ in me is achieving an eternal glory and it's unstoppable in you. It will not stop. So, what will you do, last verse? Where are you fixing your eyes? On your own ability? On your own charm? On your own looks? On your own intellect? On your own sporting prowess? Or will you focus your eyes on Christ in me? My joyous Christ. No, we don't fix our eyes on what's seen. We fix our eyes on what's unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. The next morning, Charlie walked into the hospice, and the most senior nurse in the hospice was a very experienced woman in her 60s. She was in charge of the ward. He knew, he knew Alan had died straight away. He walked in, and she saw him. He was on his way to work, and she looked at him, and the tears started rolling down her face. She was an experienced nurse of 40 years. Charlie said, he's gone, hasn't he? She said, he's gone. And she cried. She cried, proper cried. And he said, 
Why are you crying like that? You must have seen hundreds and hundreds of people pass away. And she said, because she knew him by now, she said, Charlie, I've seen thousands of people pass away. But I've never, ever seen a person like Alan. The most humble, self-effacing, interested in others, kind and generous and thoughtful. The most willing to speak of his God, of any human being I've ever seen. If that's what it is to follow Jesus Christ, count me in. And Charlie says, then a penny dropped. Sixteen hours earlier, the last thing he'd ever taught me was that he was a dirty old man checking out the nurses. So that I would not understand, understand that the Christian life is not my ability to change myself. It is that I have Christ in me. And he is beautiful in my jar of clay. So you see, my friends, Paul doesn't want you to be discouraged. He wants you to be of good heart. Let me finish with a rubbish personal story which wasn't quite being 80 and checking out the nurse. Have you ever done this at your club? You know you're training and you're on the Astro or you're in the gym and everything stops. It would happen to me probably once a season. Everything stops. Everyone stops around you. Whoa! The game stops. And somebody goes, Dano, what did you just say? You go, what did I just say? Now, after, as I got older, I worked out what it was. I'd say a swear word. Because you hear them all the time, right? They're all around you when you play. It's part of the culture. And when I least expect it, I'd have said a bad word. And everyone go, did you just? I thought it was awful. I haven't done that for years. Years. My football team played Notts County two weeks ago. They're second in the league. They haven't lost at home this season. They've won, I think, every game bar one. We're 3-0 up. 76 minutes. Like that. We're going to beat Notts County away. 76 minutes. 3-1. You know what's coming. <laughs> but we've gone five or six minutes. They haven't notched. I'm going, oh, we'll see this out. We'll see this out. But it's like the Alamo. Waves. Crowd. 83 minutes, 3-2. You know in your heart, you know. Don't you? You know. You're a player, right? You know. Momentum. Psychology. Bang! 3-all. 88. Everybody where I'm sitting, like where we're sitting, everybody's gone, ah! For a split second. And then, everybody looked at me. Like about six people around me went. <laughs> and I went, oh my word, I did not. I went to the football club a couple of days later. I've gone in. Someone's gone, Dono. I've heard you said at Notts County. You never did, did you? I went. It's not me but Christ. <laughs> well, I was prepping this talk, wasn't I? They said, what? Well, Christ swears like that. <laughs> I said, no, that's the real me. The reason it shocks people is that they see Christ, see? That's my only hope. I was able to say, it's my only hope is Christ. You see nothing, that's just the surface of how rubbish I am. Christ is my hope. Do not be discouraged, my friend. Take your university by storm. Knowing this, that the Christian life, focus on it, is not a changed life. It's an exchange life. And he's waiting for you to come home. And he's never disappearing. Keep heart. Stay strong by focusing on that. 
and you're made. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, thank you so much. Keep us in good heart by having our eyes on Christ. Let our focus be on him. Let our joy be in him. Let our hope be in his exchange for our fractured soul with his own spirit. And may every colleague that I have the privilege of standing amongst now, who are the ambassadors of the gospel in our best universities in the country, may everyone here know the joy of standing with Christ in the rest of this year and indeed forever. Thank you for Alan. Thank you for Charlie. And pray for Charlie that he may keep on sharing Christ as his life. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen.